We know that everybody loves being outdoors and sunshine and beautiful weather, but we may not always realize that sun can also have some harmful effects, especially in patients with skin of color who may not be used to wearing sunscreen and oftentimes may not readily sunburn. And in today's discussion, I'm really glad to have these expert dermatologists here who are experts not only in all aspects of skin, hair, and nails, but particularly in skin of color. And these board certified dermatologists are gonna help us dispel some myths about sun safety, skin cancer, and even some skin diseases that are affected by chronic UV exposure. Dr. Perez, I'd want you to kick this discussion off and talk to us a little bit about what you think are the most common myths that you see in your patients with darker skin types. Actually, not only in my patients, it's very well documented in the literature. I will take you to the example of the Hispanic patients and then we can then proceed to the African Americans. Hispanic patients, so if you evaluate patients in a clinic and you ask them, a bunch of Hispanic, uh, do you sunburn? 43% of them will tell you that yes, they sunburn. And then you will proceed to ask them, do you think that sunburn is associated with skin cancer? They will tell you no. 35% of them only will tell you that it's associated with skin cancer. That idea that sun damage is associated with skin cancer is not present in that population. Uh, if you look a little bit more into the family, you will find out that many of those Hispanic young teenagers are going to tanning beds, they're not applying sunblock, they don't know how to do exams, uh, self-exams. So there is that misconception in this population that actually is gonna be the largest minority population sometime soon. They don't see themselves at risk of skin cancer, but they are. It's actually more troublesome when in the last two decades, the incidence of melanoma has increased by 20% in the population of Hispanics in the United States. Not only has increased the incidence, but is also being diagnosed at a younger age with a more advanced disease, which carries a more poor prognosis. And when we look at all that, that is actually affecting a large proportion of the population that is at risk of dying. Let's remember, melanoma is still lower incidence in Hispanic, but is killing more Hispanics than other diseases. So we need to find out how to help this population remove that myth and actually intervene. We have to educate our Hispanic population to increase their, uh, their awareness of their risk. We have to actually teach, that's the reason why we're doing all the teach our colleagues that think that the Hispanics, because they're a little darker skinned, they are not at risk of skin cancer. No, they are, and they need a full body scan. And you need to check in between the toes, in the nails, because those are areas of melanomas that people, you know, some practitioners don't think of. So I'm really glad you focused on the word educate, because I think we as the expert dermatologists here know that education about skin cancer and sun protection is so important. I know you've you talked a lot about your Hispanic family members, mm -hmm. your patients. I see this even in our patients of Indian origin, which is our my background of Asian patients, African-American patients. I think that the education about sunscreen is, is so important in skin cancer protection. Dr. Burgess, I know you do lots of medical and aesthetics in your practice. Talk a little bit about some of the tips in sunscreen that you recommend for your darker skin types. Well, for one, when we talk about sun protection, there are two types. And the, most patients were exposed to the really chalky, ashy, graying type sunscreens that they may have gotten from a non-skin of color dermatologist. And I think when they come to our office, they actually believe us more than they say, well, they think that I'm, I'm not white, so I don't need it. And they were just saying that to every patient who came in the room. But if they hear it from us, I think it's more believable. So I, I teach my patients how to use certain type of opaque sunscreens. And they're necessary when we see conditions like melasma or photosensitizing con conditions or diseases and where they use the preparation, put it in the hand and really shear it and then apply it. You'll see it's not as chalky or as ashy looking as um, if just taking it and dabbing it on and then rubbing it in. So definitely avobenzone containing sunscreens are more cosmetically elegant for skin of color 
However, there are certain conditions where you're going to need that opaque sunscreen. So you bring up some ingredients like avobenzone, some of the opaque sunscreens, which I think you're alluding to more the Have physical zinc. blockers yeah, with physical zinc block, and titanium. Yes. Are, do you, if someone pins you to the wall and you know you have those patients who say, tell me your favorite sunscreen ingredient, do you have one for your skin of color I, patients? I, I actually like the avobenzone containing products because I tell patients like my skin color, I am have an innate SPF of 13, okay? But the American Academy of Dermatology recommends we all have 30. So even I have to use sunscreen and I tell them, if your breast area and your butt area are different colors than the rest of your skin, you have sun damage, okay? And I, your, your original color is not what you see. Therefore, from beginning of time, when you're a little child on up, you should wear sunscreen. So I, I really prefer the avobenzone only because it goes on sheer. You don't have to think about it. It's more moisturizing for the patients because we always complain of being ashy. So they like that one better, but there are a lot of instances in where they need more of a physical block, whether it's incandescent light or ultraviolet radiation that we see. So your titanium dioxide, your zinc oxide, your iron oxides are very important um, to protect the individual. So I, I completely agree with you. And I get pinned on that question a lot about what is your favorite sunscreen? Because a lot of patients just come in, they want to know what is your favorite brand? And my really ground response to patients is my favorite sunscreen is the one that you're going to use the most compliant. With. Right. Exactly. So exactly. I, I am brand agnostic, kind of like what you're saying. But I agree with you that the ingredients are important because if the ingredients aren't going to suit the patient's skin type, we know that the patient is not going to use, use it, it and be exactly. compliant. And, and Dr. Perez talked a little bit about melanoma, and I'm glad you mentioned that because we always hear about melanoma in, in the media, online, in print. Dr. Banasali is here, who's a social media expert and also a skin of color expert. Talk to me a little bit about what you can give us as tips on how to educate your patients, especially the younger generation, who we're really trying to target with these messages about being safe and protected in sun, but also to see a board certified dermatologist. Sure, so you guys kind of touched on it before. Um, the SPF, so when, when darker skin patients come to my office, like, oh, I have SPF 30 or 50 naturally, it's fine. I promise you don't. Um, <laughs> generally, I think the studies have shown anywhere from SPF 5 to 15, but whatever that is, it's still not enough. And as we recommend, SPF 30 bare minimum. If you're going to be on the beach, go 50 or higher. Um, and in, in kind of to piggyback off what you guys were speaking, I also think what you're doing makes a difference. I do think chemical sunscreens are a little bit better if you're sweating or if you're in the pool, just because they give you a little bit more water resistance. But um, in general, I use it. That's the most important part of it. Uh, I think a lot of it, I think people forget that you can have skin cancers with darker skin types. My own grandfather had a, or great grandfather, excuse me, had a melanoma. Um, he actually died from it uh, way before I was born, but it stuck with me. That I, you know, this is something I thought about obviously growing up, but then when I was old enough, my parents said, oh, you know, be careful, wear sunscreen. And I think sometimes we forget that um, because we might have a touch more protection doesn't protect us. And I, I had my first sunburn in college and I admit it and it was a good lesson for me because you know you sometimes think that you're, you're kind of uh, impermeable and you, you won't get these same issues, but it happened. And if it can happen to me, it can happen to anybody. And now as a board certified dermatologist with you know, extensive experience, I've seen the worst ends and worst cases of this and more melanomas that I care to count. And I think a lot of times with this, we, uh, again, we, we sometimes, uh, we kind of go with the grain and we're like, okay, we'll be fine, we'll be fine. But, you know, simple things um, can really change the outlook you have on life. And whether it's sun protection for melanoma, skin cancer, which is most important, even aging and photo aging. And so many people come to our offices for lasers and expensive treatments. And I tell them the number one ingredient, the number one thing in the world you can do is simply wear sunscreen or use other sun protective measures. Yeah, I tell patients it's the number one anti-aging exactly. preparation exactly. is sun yes. protection. Right. Actually, so. there's been studies done in the African-American population in which patients were put prospectively in sun blocks and in the exposed areas and they were followed and there is actually improvement of the discoloration and the wrinkling. So just by doing that, if you're not interested in not getting melanoma, these don't, don't get aging. <laughs> and, and I think, you know, when we talk about not just skin cancer, mm -hmm. but even other chronic dermatologic conditions, 
this is a great opportunity for, to, for us to educate our patients. You mentioned melasma, and I'm really glad Dr. Burgess mentioned that because that's a disease that I'm particularly interested in. And I tell my patients who come in with melasma that this is a chronic skin disease, just like if you had atopic dermatitis, just like if you had psoriasis. Melasma never fully goes away. I tell my patients I can guide you and get you better, but the minute you have that sun exposure and stop wearing your sunscreen, you're gonna get that pigment back. And a lot of times it's those visits where patients come in for more aesthetic reasons, like discoloration and dispigmentation, that I'm able to change the dialogue and remind them also about skin cancer, sun protection, and photo protection. So I'm really glad you mentioned that. Let's, let's take a little step back though and talk a little bit more basics, especially for maybe the public who may not be as educated in terms of the most common skin cancers. We mentioned melanoma, but w w there's also other types of skin cancers. In fact, there's others that are even more common. Do you wanna mention a couple of those? Yeah, you know, what I had, seen um, in more of an elderly population, and it's more the South, we're, we're kind of covering that area, but these were people who grew up sitting in front of a fireplace or a wood-burning stove and always got burned on the front of the leg. And so then they come in the office and I, I have this rash that just won't go away on you know the front of their leg. And a lot of times we biopsy, it's, it's a skin cancer, squamous cell carcinoma in situ. So we see those a lot and hopefully as time goes on, these elderly patients would have been long gone because we don't tend to sit in front of the, but I tell patients a burn is a burn is a burn. Regardless if you get a burn from a chemical or the fireplace or the sun, you have to protect your skin. And these are the areas when you develop the sunburn can turn into skin cancers. And talk a little bit about, um, maybe Maritza, mm -hmm. you can comment a little bit about uh, basal cell carcinoma. Mm -hmm. I know that, I mean, we know that that's the most common type of skin mm -hmm. cancer. You mentioned squamous cell, mm -hmm. a very common one. Tell us a little bit, what is basal cell and how can we explain that? Because I feel like darker skin type patients come in and they think, oh, it's only the, the lighter skin type patients who can get a basal cell. I see basal cell carcinoma all the time in darker skin types. Do you as well? Yes, very often, and they are certainly very often pigmented. Yes. So they are look darker and yeah. they can even imitate a melanoma. So you might yeah. look at mm -hmm. them it's like, oh, this might be a melanoma. So basal cell carcinoma is the most common skin cancer in both Caucasians, African-Americans and, um, uh, and Hispanics. Uh, and sometimes the African-Americans can have a little more of the squamous cell if there's areas of inflammation and scarring. But basal cell carcinoma usually shows like a little pearly, uh, little nodule but in pigmented patients, it has pigment, so might be confused with a melanoma. And they have, actually, there's only one study of non-melanoma skin cancers that has evaluated uh, patients of uh, uh, Hispanic origin, and it was uh, do done by Alicia Ruiz and the group in San Diego, and it was retrospective study, in which they demonstrated that the incidence of non-melanoma skin cancer in Hispanics can be up to 3%, and it's usually in a young Younger population and females as compared to the Asians and the Caucasians. So we see this repeatedly. It's like the Hispanic patients that think that they are not prone to skin cancer are developing the skin cancers earlier and they are not really getting all the benefits of the education. They need to be educated so that they will remove that potential for death, especially from melanoma. A little, sorry, a little trick that we're doing now with the younger patients is, so we now live in the, the era of smartphones, right? Mm -hmm. And a lot of times they'll come in with little molds, they don't want to biopsy them on their face or anything like that. So I have all my patients take photos. And once a month, push notification on your phone, take a photo. Any change whatsoever, whether it's larger, shape, color, anything at all, come see me, we take it off. And that's one of the ways, again, I think people get so nervous, they don't even want to come see us at all, but then we kind of have a bridge, kind of a path to when we're going to biopsy and why we're going to biopsy. Obviously, if we see it and we think it's a skin cancer, it goes. But this is a way for us to kind of monitor things and have our patients actively engage. And even for my, my patients, when they come in, we go through the pictures together and I show them what am I looking for, why am I doing it? And that part of education, I think with the younger group, is serving itself pretty well now. Take a selfie and you can <laughs> monitor your lesion. I Doctor's think that's very orders. important. It's a great idea. And, and those have come in really handy in my practice as mm -hmm. well. Great. What are some of the tips that all of you have for encouraging your patients to come in routinely for skin exams? I find that in my darker skin type patients, that's a challenge. 
to remind yes. these patients to come in annually or yeah. every six months. But you know, I think I see, uh, patients see a lot of separate keratoses. And if you use all the criteria and what we use for melanoma, everybody has melanoma everywhere on their body. And I tell them, only a board certified dermatologist is going to be able to decipher between those. So you can't see your back. So that's a, one main uh, reason why you would come in. And two, melanomas can occur where the sun doesn't shine. Okay, so if you're able to look at at all your body parts, which no one is. And in fact, um, we encourage that when we do a full body exam, you take all of your clothes off and we check through the scalp all the way down to the bottom of the feet. And I love that you mentioned the feet mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. I have seen so many cases. I had a patient just yesterday before uh, the end of the clinic who had what's called an acrolentiginous melanoma, which required amputation of a digit. And I've seen yes. that story repeat yes. multiple times, more than I would like to. Yes. And it's scary because patients come in and I ask them to remove their shoes and socks. People don't want to do that. Like, they're, not, they're, they're not accustomed <laughs> to us asking them to do that. And then I say, I'm going to get really in between your toes and look everywhere. And under the nails. And, mm -hmm. and re Exactly. And so I think uh, what we're doing here today, I think, is powerful because we really want to educate the public. Do you have any tips, either of you, on what you've seen in your skin cancer practices, especially when it comes to biopsying these lesions and really sort of alleviating fears of patients who come in? I think there's a lot of myths that, oh, it's just a small growth, it'll go away on its own, or oh, I don't need to have it checked or tested. One of the things that my patients sometimes think is that, well, but if you biopsy, are the cells gonna travel? What we're gonna do, we're gonna take the whole lesion in totality, we're gonna send it to the pathologist, he's going to be able to analyze it in its totality, and if there's nothing to worry about, we got rid of something ugly that was not, didn't need to be on your skin. But if it's something important, we will be able to manage this afterwards. Because remember, as dermatologists, board certified dermatologists, we not only make the diagnosis, we actually treat the patients. And talk a little bit about how skin cancers are treated. You know, I, I, I oftentimes, when I make that phone call to give a diagnosis, especially to a darker skin type patient about a basal cell mm -hmm. or a, a, a melanoma in situ, which is an early form of melanoma, you can hear the fear in the patient's voice. And, you know, I think we, no one likes to deliver bad news, but that's our job as, as physicians to do that. When I tell a patient they have a skin cancer, I think we're lucky that in dermatology, there's lots of different ways to treat skin cancer. So I always try to make a negative into a positive and kind of give patients their options. Do you have any pearls or do either of you have any pearls on how you discuss treating skin yeah, cancer? Well, well, if they're basal cells or squamous cell carcinomas, I usually try to, and if they're not in specific areas in where there's increased risk of recurrence or uh, Mohs surgery is necessary, I usually start with topical and I tell them we can get rid of a lot of these or definitely shrink the lesion um, in where a Mohs surgeon can take it off usually with great margins and they conserve the tissue and that's the purpose of uh, Mohs surgery is so you don't have a big hack job which sometimes if you go to a surgeon that's what happens so that we can cosmetically also take this skin cancer out and you know pretty much when you do the surgery or you do the treatment you can cure the person of it so it, it's very important to mention that you can cure these types of diseases melanoma that's a different story and depending on how soon you're diagnosed and treated is is a big concern but squamous cell and basal cell carcinoma they are easily treated. And um, so imiquimod is one of the treatments that I recommend to a lot of patients. I follow them closely and make sure that, you know, afterwards I may biopsy the lesion again and to ensure that it's gone. But there are topical treatments that are pretty much available anywhere. Um, now I think they're generic, so they've been around for a long time that are and I like to be how successful. You, I like how you said that because there are various treatment options. 
that we as the physician can tailor to the patient's needs. Yeah. It's not always surgery. Right. It doesn't always because have to be one way or the other. Because if they're 90 years old, I'm not going to send them for surgery. Right. And I and I think we in, in, as board certified mm -hmm. dermatologists are the unique specialty that can tailor yeah. treatment right. that really other physicians may not be able to. The only one that is really only curable with surgery is melanoma. If you diagnose a melanoma in an early stage, it's curable by excision. And it's, surgery is the only thing that is curable. But actually, nowadays, you know, there's lentigo malignant melanomas in this elderly patient. Now, imiquimod is being used as well for in, uh, inducing uh, regression of the lesions, and maybe you can just do less amount of surgery for those. When I have a melanoma patient, uh, even though most surgery has been indicated, I try to have permanent sections. And what I do is I do a, a, a control border excision, so I divide the the, uh, the surrounding of the melanoma in four quadrants. I send it for permanent section, but I dye the, the, the tissue like if it was for Mohs, and they evaluate, the histopathologists evaluate the whole periphery and know that the whole periphery is totally negative before I perform a repair. I think these are great options that we can share with our patients. Any final tidbit and pearl from you for your patients, Dr. Bonacelli? I mean, I think you kind of hit it on the head, right? you can cure these cancers. If you catch them early enough, I mean, you know, unfortunately with a bunch of our colleagues who kind of have patients come in with advanced cancers, it's sometimes too late or it's already gone to different places. With us, you just have to come and look. And I think in, in a weird way, I always say with like actinic keratosis, which are pre-cancers, it's the greatest privilege in the world. It's like, look, I'm not giving you a cancer, but I, I might get one there later. And it just forces you to kind of keep a little bit more awareness of what's going on. So once a year, go see your friendly board certified dermatolo dermatologist. If God forbid something is there, you catch it early. I've had many patients under the age of 35 get melanomas and skin cancers. You just remove it. And I think if you're, if you're diligent about that, skin cancer won't be, you know, the issue that unfortunately leads you to all sorts of health problems down the line. It'll, you know, it'll, it'll be one of those things that'll be a memory, but it'll be one that's treated. And I always tell everybody, like, look, just get checked. We've talked about basal cell, you mentioned squamous cell, you guys have talked about melanoma. Those are probably the three most common we see, but there are other types of skin cancers as well. Can you comment a little bit on some of those types? Oh yes, so as the immunodermatologist most surgeon that exists in this world, I, my original uh, first life in dermatology was cutaneous cell lymphoma. And let's not forget that cutaneous cell lymphoma is a real lymphoma of the skin is dysfunction of uh, T cells that are attacking the, the skin and you can actually have patients die from the disease. So early detection and early treatment is necessary to save those lives. And this is not lymphoma of the blood system, this is lymphoma of the skin. It and, starts in the skin, yeah. but it can go into the system. And there's a variant in skin of color exactly. in where it's hypopigmented mm -hmm. versus hyperpigmented. So sometimes it's misdiagnosed, mm -hmm. and so it's very, very important that you see someone get a biopsy done, and it, in fact, several biopsy mm -hmm. in different areas in order for the diagnosis, but it is a diagnosis that we can simply define by just doing a skin biopsy. So this is a great educational point. Basal cell carcinoma, squamous cell carcinoma, melanoma, cutaneous T cell lymphoma, and of course, other rare things, vascular tumors, mm -hmm. other skin sarcomas, lots of things can happen. The skin's the largest organ, lots of places for things to go wrong and for our expertise. Any final pearl, Dr. Burgess? I think we've covered everything. I think we've done a great I, job. Yeah. That's, that, yeah. that's right. Do you have any last words? I think that just going to your friendly board certified dermatologist <laughs> will save you a lot of aggravation in the future. And we are a friendly group, so that's yes, exactly right. Yes. You know, I think the most important thing is that we use, uh, educate the patients that skin cancer does not see skin color. Mm -hmm. yeah. No matter what your skin tone, what your skin type, use sunscreen, get checked, anything growing or suspicious, look for a board certified dermatologist and look for one who specializes in skin of color. Thank you all for being here. This has been a fantastic, vibrant discussion. I learned so much from you today and always when we get together. And please visit skinofcolorsociety.org to learn more about all of our efforts in sun protection, skin cancer, and skin diseases and darker skin type.